All right, I think we're ready to go now. So uh, let me go ahead and get started. Um, appreciate your patience there. It took me a second to to figure it out, but I think we've I think we've got it now. So let me go ahead and uh, start the presentation, and we'll dive right in and not waste uh, any more. All right. So today, what I want to talk to you about, of course, is the forex market, and of course, I appreciate. Uh, uh, Yana and Morgan uh, and all the all the people at Trading Pub for having me on. So uh, let me thank our uh, host for a second. Uh, but today they've invited me to talk about the Forex market, and that's what I've been trading now for over 10 years. Uh, I started out as a mortgage banker. Uh, my first uh, career was as a mortgage banker, uh, and um, in that particular profession, I started to dabble in the bonds markets. Uh, I also started to dabble in uh, learning about uh, fundamentals and what really drove uh, the economy and things like that. And so uh, in that particular market, we needed to uh, be able to sell loans and package loans. And so all of all of the, uh, the economics played a factor in that. Uh, and that started to pique my interest in trading. Uh, and uh, to make a long story short, I uh, came across the, uh, the Forex market uh, and I started to trade that back in... Uh, uh, two, oh, 2002, uh, and then moved over into that uh, as a uh, full-time profession, uh, switched uh, firms and went, uh, went to work for uh, an actual firm that traded currencies uh, in 2003 and switched over into that as a full-time profession. Uh, and so I've been doing that now for, like I said, over 10 years. And today what I want to share uh, are several things about how you can put together a very simple uh, trading system and trading plan for trading the currency markets. If you don't have currencies as part of your portfolio yet, uh, then you may want to consider adding them after this presentation. And I show you just how easy it is uh, to really catch big trends in the currency markets. So I call this my 2014 Forex Battle Plan web webinar. And let me start out by saying that, of course, positive past performance is no guarantee of future performance. And you should also never trade with money that you can't afford to lose. You know, trading isn't about the gambler mentality. Uh, I heard a story recently of a guy who took uh, two briefcases into a Las Vegas casino. Uh, one of the briefcases was empty and the other one was filled with $750,000. He walked up to uh, the, the roulette wheel and uh, he put all the chips of the $750,000 on one spin. He won went and cashed all of his chips in and took the two briefcases out. Of course, each of them filled with $750,000. Now, most gamblers don't have, uh, the, uh, don't have the wherewithal to walk out of a casino at that particular point. And that's why Las Vegas is built. So gambling isn't about, you know, uh, our trading isn't about gambling. And that's not what we're talking about here today. Uh, so if you ever find that you're gambling with your money, it's probably time to stop trading. All right, so what are we going to cover today specifically? We're going to talk about a three-pronged trading approach that I've used. Uh, it's not just technicals. It's not just fundamentals, but we combine uh, those things uh, along with psychologicals of the market. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the five economic indicators for dominating currencies and really the only five economic indicators that you really need to look at in order to get a big picture view of the market. And I'm really big on uh, getting a big picture view of the market. You need, to, you need to have a big picture view of what's going on both fundamentally and technically. I think it was Ed Sakota who said, the farther you step back from a chart, the clearer things become. Uh, and so obviously what he was talking about was uh, getting a larger picture, getting a bigger view uh, of a particular market so that you can see a very clear picture of that market. We're going to talk about three types of technical trades, and then at the end, I'm going to give you two trade setups that you can start using today in your trading, no matter what kind of a trading system you use. You can apply these couple of techniques. Uh, if you're a day trader, it doesn't matter. If you're a swing trader, it doesn't matter. If you're more of a long-term trend follower, it doesn't matter. You can use these particular techniques in whatever your trading system is uh, to get a better advantage. So trading is a long-term affair. Let me say that again. Trading is a long-term affair. And what do I mean by trading is a long-term affair? Well, it's pretty simple. I've never seen anyone get rich quick from trading. 
Uh, now, let me define what that means. I've seen a lot of people make money fast uh, in trading, only to lose it and a lot more, generally even faster. Uh, and so if you're new to trading, then I propose that you think in terms of the next seven to 10 years, and then you work backwards. Um, the, the presenter before me uh, who was on, he's been a floor trader for 20 years. So that's obviously a long-term affair. You want to approach trading from that mindset. In other words, you want to approach trading from the mindset of, I'm going to be doing this 10 years from now or 20 years from now. You don't want to look at it like a get-rich-quick type of a thing. I love a quote that I once heard, not necessarily a quote, but an idea that I once heard, uh, and I think it's fitting for this thought, and it goes like uh, this. The poor think in terms of days, or they think in terms of from day to day. The middle class think in terms of months, or they think from month to month. The rich think in terms of years or from year to year, and the wealthy think in terms of decades or from decade to decade. Uh, and really, that's the greatest piece of advice that I can give you about trading is for you to get out of the day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month mindset and really get into more of the year-to-year and even decade-to-decade type of a mindset. Now, every great trade starts with a plan. Uh, you don't make a, a great trade by accident. You can make a good trade by accident, but you'll never make a great trade by accident. I remember my first demo account that I opened up uh, many, many years ago, and I just started without even knowing what I was doing, just making some trades and trying to get used to the order system. And I put on some trades, and I woke up the next day, and the demo account had made like $11,000. And uh, of course, at that time, I didn't have an understanding of this particular statement. You can make a good trade without a plan, but you can't make a great trade without a plan. And really what trading is all about is uh, having probably a lot of uh, losing trades, mediocre trades, and even good trades uh, in between your great trades. Uh, because the great trades are really what makes uh, your, your trading career. Now, in the military, they call it an operations order or an op order for short. That's, that's what a plan is called in the military. And really, an op order is a detailed plan on how to achieve uh, an objective from start to finish, right? So uh, today is about helping you to start defining your op order. So make no mistake about it. Uh, it's a war out there. And if you have listened to the news recently, if you've uh, paying attention to the to the markets, to the stock market, to the equities markets, to the commodities markets, to the currency uh, currencies markets. It's a war out there. And what I'm talking about is a currency war. And it's one that most people don't even have a clue is really happening. Now, we're going to dive into this in detail when I talk about the five economic indicators uh, that I follow to get a big picture view of the currency markets. All right. So, Thank you for letting me take a longer introduction than I normally would. Uh, let me get started now with the meat of this presentation. When traders come to me for advice, uh, I often ask them one simple question. Why do you want to trade? Now, this is really the first fundamental question that you need to answer in order to start developing your plan. You know, do you want to trade for money? Do you want to trade for fortune or for fame? or maybe for freedom, freedom of time, freedom of freedom of money. Uh, maybe you want to be able to help your family or you have a goal to fund a charity. What's your primary reason for trading? Now, there's no wrong or right answer here. You just have to be honest with yourself. Why do you want to trade? If you can't answer that question, then it's going to be very hard for you to uh, stick out the hard times in trading. Also, I asked them, what do you want to accomplish with your trading efforts? This is a really important question because if you don't know what your goal is, you can't get there. You know, do you want a hedge fund manager? Uh, do, you, do you want to be able to your day job and have more time to see your family? You know, these are two completely different objectives and they require a completely different plan. So depending on what your goal is, you have to approach trading completely different. If you're going to be a hedge fund manager, you have, to, you have to approach a trading system completely different than finances. So 
understanding this goal and, and, and defining this goal and where you want to go is extremely important uh, in your trading career. Now, with this in mind, I want to share my particular trading approach and how this knowledge can benefit you. So here's my whole approach to get to this place. Uh, and, and really, it's that simpler is better. Um, and Albert Einstein is quoted as saying, everything should be made as simple as possible, not simpler. And I know it sounds like that simpler, truly better. Um, now, I used to try to make things very complicated. And that's really human nature is to overcomplicate things. Uh, and the further that I got along in this, uh, the more that I realized I wanted to simplify my system. I wanted to make things easier, not more complicated. Uh, and so I began to take things away from my system of trading uh, instead of adding things to them. And I know that many of you have probably gone through that same cycle. Uh, and this chart, this next screen here will probably, uh, you can probably, identify that you're trying to uh, gather from uh, that it's very difficult for you to come to any kind of real decision making process uh, and obviously the picture wasn't put here to make fun of you know traders who have multiple monitors uh, uh, you know but rather to a point that human nature is really to overcomplicate things and when it comes to trading overcomplicating things can really cause several things to happen and I call this the crazy cycle. This is a cycle that every trader goes through at one point or another as you're learning how to trade and you're, you're learning you know, about yourself because trading is all about learning about yourself. You're learning about you know, what particular type of system fits your objective. Uh, that's really the key objective. Then you, have to, then you have to fit the system to that objective, not the other way around. You don't get a system and then make objectives based on that system. You have an objective, then you find a system that fits that objective. All right, so it starts out, the crazy cycle starts out with confusion. Confusion comes because of this uh, screen, like the previous picture, where the guy was looking at multiple screens and looking at so many different things that uh, he really couldn't come to any kind of a conclusion. It was confusion. Uh, and confusion always leads to indecision in trading. Uh, and then, of course, indecision leads to missed opportunities, all right? Now, missed opportunities are uh, extremely, extremely costly uh, because not only do you not get into the particular trade or maybe you get in too late, you don't get in at all, uh, maybe you get in too early, whatever the case is, it's a missed opportunity and it's extremely costly and that causes losses and you can, you can have losses by not actually entering a trade. Uh, let's say that too much information going to the beginning of a new trend or not. Or you're not sure if there's a reversal in the market or not. Uh, and so you don't take that opportunity. And that could lead to that great trade, that big trade that would have made your year. And instead, you miss the opportunity. And now you do what is called revenge trading. Uh, you say, well, I got to get this back. I got to, I missed this opportunity and I've got a full lessons I've ever learned in trading. And this was told, told to me by a great commodity trader uh, at this particular time that I, that I was mentored by him. He had been trading for about 40 years as a commodities trader uh, and he's very successful. And he said, <clears throat> he said this to me, he said, Cecil, do you have an unlimited amount of capital? And of course, the answer to that question is no, I don't have an unlimited amount of capital. Uh, much like you probably don't have an unlimited amount of capital. So he said, okay, you don't have an unlimited amount of capital. He said, then you need to protect your capital. He said, opportunities are unlimited. Opportunities are unlimited, but capital isn't. So protect your money, protect the capital, right? Missed opportunities can be detrimental because you think that there's never going to be another opportunity like that that comes around. The key, if you've ever missed an opportunity like that, is just to be patient and wait for that great opportunity to come around again. 
get very confident in your system in between the time that you miss the opportunity and the next opportunity, get very confident, get very focused, and then take the next opportunity. And in between, don't revenge trade. And then you will not have to go through the, the cycle of having those losses. Of course, losses uh, leads to frustration, and then the cycle starts all over again. You say, well, maybe this pr approach isn't working for me, or this isn't the approach that I want to take. So you jump to the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and this creates a crazy cycle. Now, being on this crazy cycle is really like, uh, I, I, if, I, if I could pick, put a picture in your mind, uh, if you were ever, a, when you were a kid, you sat in the middle of a, of a merry-go-round, and you had all your friends, you know, spin the spin the merry-go-round extremely fast. Well, if you're in the middle, you're not going to fall off the merry-go-round because gravity is basically taking control. Uh, and no matter how much you try, when you're in the middle, you can't get up. You know, the centrifugal force is basically keeping you there. If you get on the outside of that, then you can get thrown off. So really the key is, is to break outside of this particular cycle so that you can get thrown out of the cycle. And hopefully today, I'm going to share some stuff with you. They look to find the best trading methods or techniques available. So they go on a treasure hunt. You know, usually uh, they first stumble across fundamental analysis. Now, fundamental analysis, of course, teaches a trader to approach their trading decisions based on information about a country, a stock, a currency, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You're basically building your entire trading approach based on new information that's coming into the market, right? So as that new information comes into the market, you basically make decisions on that new information. Now, this is great for finding the right market to start looking at, uh, but it makes it very difficult to enter and exit a market. Fundamental analysis is great for defining a particular stock or a currency uh, or a commodity uh, that could be close to having a breakout or a big trend or maybe a big reversal of some kind, a big trend collapse, so to speak. And so fundamental analysis is great for that, but it's not very good for timing your entries and your exit. Uh, you know, a lot of fundamentalists, they will pick a market perfectly. They'll get into the market and they'll even have a target uh, for that particular market. The problem is, is because they don't know how to how to time their entries and exits where they may get in and out of that particular market several times over the course of a, of a year or a couple of years or several months. They give away a lot of their profits or sometimes they they turn a, a an extremely profitable trade into a, a, a losing trade. And that's one thing that you don't want to do. The next thing that traders come across, and many of you are probably in this, is technical analysis. Uh, usually, you know, after a few losses from trading using fundamentals or, you know, the fact that, you know, a lot of fundamentalists uh, overcomplicate things uh, and, you know, it can be very hard. Trader usually progresses to using technical analysis. And technical analysis, of course, has its, its advantages and disadvantages also. You know, like which indicator should I use? You know, should I use candlesticks or bar charts or line charts or, you know, point and figure or, you know, which market should I trade? And really the list goes on and on. And before you know it, you are getting conflicting signals and you're really second guessing yourself. Then we get to what I call trading, behavioral trading. Behavioral trading is really the approach that I use and I teach others to use. And it combines the psychology or the mood of the market uh, the fundamentals or what I call the mind of the market and the technicals or what I call the body of the market. And it's really a three pronged approach uh, that is proven to work over the long run for me. Now the key in trading and in life, as far as I'm concerned is balance. Uh, if you, you know, if you just worked out your body all of the time, but you never worked out your mind, you'd really be out of balance. Uh, if you only fed your mind and not your body, you'd starve before long. Uh, so we look at the overall mood of the market. We want to know, is the market trending? Uh, uh, is it sleepy? That means there's, there's no trend. There's not much movement. There's, there's a consolidated state. Uh, is the market angry or confused? That generally comes with a volatile market, a sideways market. It has little sustained direction. 
uh, is the market what I call happy. That's a steady, smooth trend. You can have multiple types of trends. You can have a smooth trend, which is basically just a what I call a parallel market. It's just a straight market that goes in a, in a very parallel line, one direction. Uh, you can have a volatile trend where it's a trend, but it's, it's whipsaw back and forth, right? Uh, so we want to get a, a picture, a big picture of what the market state is right now. We also want to know what are the powers that be saying about the market. Uh, you know, what are, what, are the, what are the big guys saying about the market? This creates a general sentiment about the market. Next, we look at the fundamentals, and the fundamentals help us determine what market to be trading at any given time. Uh, fundamentals are essentially made up of the stories that investors or the powers that be are exchanging about the market and any other important data that is being released. And then lastly, we look at the technical, such as price action, trends, volatility, and momentum. And this really gives us our three prong trading approach. <clears throat> now, I'm a firm believer in trend following. Um, even if you're trading a mean revision type of a system, uh, I still think that trying to capitalize on the trend is probably the easiest and best way to make money as a trader. Uh, I think that the majority of the trend, now you can follow the trend whether you're a short-term trader, a medium-term trader, or a long-term trader, it doesn't really matter. And I think this is well documented uh, over the past 100 years uh, as, as the markets have even evolved tech, uh, technologically uh, and have advanced in the types of analysis that we can do and the, the systems that we can put together and the efficiency of the market. I still think that trend following uh, at the end of the day, is probably the best way to approach trading. Uh, you know, billionaire traders like uh, George Soros uh, have really made their biggest and most profitable trades by capturing large trends in the market. Of course, you know, investors like Warren Buffett, you know, they capitalize on big trends. You know, that's how they make their money. And with that said, you know, we take our three-pronged behavioral trading approach and we apply it to finding and exploiting the best trends in the currency markets. <clears throat> now, trend following, just in case you're new to trading or you really don't know, <clears throat> uh, is essentially two parts, right? There's two parts to the equation here. The first part is trend. So without a trend, a trader doesn't make money. You know, think about it. If you buy a market, you can't make money unless you sell at higher prices. Therefore, a trend is necessary. It doesn't matter if you're trading on the one minute chart or the five minute chart or the daily chart or the weekly chart or the monthly chart, it really doesn't matter. A trend is necessary. Uh, the next part of the equation uh, is following. Now, I've said it a million times that no one trader is able to move a market for any length of time. Uh, they can move it for a period of time, but they can't do it for a long period of time. So the overall goal as a trader should be to follow the overall consensus of all other traders. Uh, and usually the big money, the smart money is in first, you know, then you have uh, the trend followers that come on board, then generally you have the masses come on board, and generally, you know, when the masses start saying that the market's going to go up forever, that's generally when the market falls. Uh, now, trend followers are reactive by na nature. Uh, you know, we don't try to forecast or predict markets or price levels necessarily. Uh, you know, predicting where the market is going to go with consistent accuracy is generally impossible. And when I say predicting where it's going to go, I mean capturing a, a large trend. I don't necessarily mean, you know, you can predict the market's going to move a few points here, a few points there. But I mean by predicting it and capturing a large, uh, large part of a trend. Now, trend traders are disciplined to follow an exact set of trading rules uh, without guessing or wild emotions necessarily. Now, here are some top reasons for considering trend following. Number one, you can profit in up and down markets, right? Trend following doesn't swear an allegiance to a bull or a bear market. It follows trends to the end, and that, that happens no matter how ridiculous trends might appear early on and no matter how insanely extended they might appear at the end, trend followers follow trends. And the reason is, is because trends always go farther than anyone expects. Uh, and now you can ignore momentum at your peril, but that's a mistake when it comes to approaching the markets. 
So you can profit in up and down markets. You don't have to worry about buy and hold. You don't have to really listen to a bunch of analysts or talking heads. You don't have to, you know, read the daily news. Uh, you know, when you when you approach trading from a trend following standpoint, there's a few economic indicators that really you you only have to pay attention to those economic indicators, and you can get a big picture view of the market. There's really no prediction involved. You're not trying to predict where the market's going to go. Uh, trend following allows you to let your profits run to make the big money and cut your losses short, which every great mentor that I've ever studied under has told me that that's the key to their success, letting profits run and cutting their losses short. It uses risk management. Uh, it takes advantage of mass psychology. Uh, it uses a scientific approach to trading. Uh, it's not, you know, guessing or guesstimating. It's, it's a very scientific, very mechanical approach. Uh, it has a strong historical performance in crisis periods. Uh, it works across all markets with liquidity. And there's no government reliance, right? When you learn how to follow trends and learn how to identify trends, you don't have to worry about the next bailout or, you know, whether or not you're going to get your, you know, your Social Security check tomorrow or your, you know, your, your government check. You don't have to worry about that. You create your own destiny when you learn how to follow trends. Now, in trend following, money management is key. Uh, and money management is really the process of asking a lot of questions about your system of risk in particular. Now, your money management system contains your position sizing rules, and it also answers the following questions. What kind of a person am I? Okay, this is really the first question to answer in money management. Uh, you know, do you have a large appetite for risk or are you risk averse? You know, I recommend to uh, people that come to me for uh, any kind of tutoring or anything like that, I recommend that they take a financial personality evaluation uh, to help them answer that question. Now, you also want to find out what kind of a trading system your personality is suited for. You know, do you like the fast pace of day trading or do you have a, more of a, of a Cadillac personality? You know, uh, you know, do you want to be at the charts for several hours a day or do you want to be at the charts for 10 minutes a day? Uh, you know, do you want to do an hour's worth of work a day or do you want five hours worth of work a day? Uh, you know, that, that's, that's all dependent on you and your objectives. Now, uh, when newbie traders generally get into this game, I see everyone of them make the same mistake just like I did. They put a lot of focus on finding the right system to trade with, uh, with without really knowing what system is best suited for their personality. So the first step is to do some basic self-work uh, to, to, to really determine what's going to work best for you. If you haven't done that yet, if you haven't taken – a personality evaluation to know what kind of a personality uh, uh, you have and how that's going to fit into trading, then you need to do that as soon as possible. The second question I ask is, what are my profit goals? What are your profit goals? You know, if your goal is to turn $1,000 into a million in the next 12 to 24 months, that's a pretty unrealistic profit goal. Uh, however, if your goal is to profit on average 30 to 50% per year, that's an attainable goal. Uh, and to achieve this, you only need to trade a system that makes on average what I call 1R uh, each week, where R stands for risk, right? So over approximately 100 trades, you should be able to determine what you can expect to make on average every single trade you place. Uh, I know, for instance, that with one of my systems, on average, I make 0.75R on every trade that I place. So if I make a 1% risk, I know that over the course of time, over the course of, say, 100 trades, on every 1% risk I make, on every trade that I risk 1% on, I'm going to make 0.75% back. So if I take 100 trades in the course of a year, I know that my profit is going to equal 75%. I know that going in, before I ever make a trade, I've already tested that system, I already know the expectancy of that particular system. So really, all I need to do is roughly place one to two trades per week in order to achieve a profit goal of 30 to 50 percent by the end of the year. Right now, if I want to, if I want to achieve more, then I have to find a way to place more trades and still keep the same expectancy. If you don't approach trading in this uh, in this view yet, then really you, you're 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 not even close. You're not even close 
to being a successful trader, all right? So you have to approach it from that particular viewpoint first. You have to know the expectancy of your system and what you're going to make on any given trade. <clears throat> so here are my beliefs about money management. I found that each person has developed uh, certain beliefs about trading, uh, the markets and money management. Uh, here are some of my particular beliefs about money management. So belief number one, and, and if, you, if you haven't dug deep enough to find your beliefs yet, then, then really you need to dig a little bit and, and come up with your belief system about money management. Here are five of, here are four of mine. Number one, most profitable systems let the winners run and cut losers quickly. Number two, I would much rather scale into a position than scale out of a position. I know a lot of systems that take half of their profits or a third of their profits. To me, uh, statistically, that is a mistake and it never works. Uh, I would rather scale into a position then scale out of a position. I'd rather take a winning position and add to that winning position versus taking profits off of the table at a certain point in that winning position. In other words, I close all of my trades out at one given time, uh, at, at, at one moment in any trade. I may have three or four trades on one particular currency in the same direction. And when it comes time to close them out, I close all of them out at that same time, even though I entered them at different levels. Number three, I add to my winners as often as I possibly can. So if I can add to a winner, I'm going to add to it. Uh, number four, risking more than 2% on any given trade is generally outside of my comfort zone and makes it difficult to achieve consistent profits over the long run. Now those are four beliefs that I have about money management, about position sizing, about my risk tolerance. Uh, what are your beliefs? You know, have you ever analyzed your beliefs about the market? Could you write down right now 30 beliefs that you have about the market and about uh, you in relationship with the market? If you can't write down those beliefs, then you don't, you, you don't have any business trying to develop a trading system yet. Uh, it starts with objectives. It starts with beliefs. And then you work from there. Uh, once you start to find those, then... Uh, and you define those, you define your objectives and what you want out of the market, you know your personality uh, and what kind of a system and what kind of a position sizing and money management approach is best going to fit you, then you can find a system to trade with. All right, so now that you have a basic approach, let me shift to talking about some of the methods that I use when it comes to the fundamental and technical part of my strategy. Now, like I said, I like to keep it simple. Uh, as I found that that's the best approach that works for me. And that's why I only look at five fundamentals when it comes to trading currencies and commodities. So here they are. Here are the five economic indicators I use to determine which markets to focus on. They are gross domestic product, consumer price index, quantitative easing or money printing, risk on, risk off, and the CRB commodity index. Now, one of the other things that we look at is long-term and short-term debt. Uh, that comes in to play with the gross domestic product. Um, and basically what I want to know there is, I want to know whether the global growth in the major economies like the United States, the United Kingdom, European Union, Japan, Australia, Canada, Switzerland, China, is it growing or is it shrinking? Also, I look at a few emerging markets, uh, Brazil, India. Uh, there are others that we look at uh, to determine whether or not those economies are growing or are they shrinking. Uh, if you have an economy that's growing very rapidly, uh, pitted against an economy that is not growing so rapidly or that's stagnated, uh, then you have a, a market that is, um, you know, ripe for a big trend. Uh, anytime you have a big shift in gross domestic product, that's really what you want to pay attention to. Anytime there's a big divergence in gross domestic product, we're not talking about going from a growth of 3% to 3.1 or 3.2%. We're talking about anytime gross domestic product goes into the negative very quickly or very sharply. That's a time that you want to start looking at the big picture of that. Now, gross domestic product, you also have to factor in debt. Now, debt plays a factor in economic growth, but it's not the debt that most people are thinking about. For instance, in the U.S., we have 
a lot of short-term debt right now. That is where our, our deficit comes in. That's also where, uh, you know, uh, where our 17 trillion or so dollars uh, in short-term debt comes in. That debt can be reduced fairly quickly if we get on a balanced budget. The long-term debt is the bigger picture here. Long-term debt cycles run about 50 to 100 years. Those are the ones that you really want to be paying attention to for the, for the long term. Now, when you have a short-term debt cycle and a long-term debt cycle coming into play uh, together at, at, at a moment of time, that's when you can have a crisis. So I know there's a lot of people out there that talk about, you know, that, that, that next month or that next year, you know, that we're going to have an implosion of our economy and that, you know, basically, you know, we're going to be reduced to nothing as a society. I don't necessarily see it that way, although I see that we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. I don't necessarily see it that way. What I see is if we don't reduce short-term debt, then we have short-term debt and long -term, a long-term debt cycle approaching that will collide. And when that happens, 5, 10, 15 years from now, we're going to have a major, major crisis on our hands. So we have probably 5, 10, maybe 15 years to get our act together. If we don't, then we're going to enter into a major, major crisis period. Uh, that's a long, long-term approach. All right. Now, anytime you have gross, uh, anytime you have short-term debt levels that exceed gross domestic product, generally you're going to have an economy or a currency that is going to uh, really take a big hit, like we saw with the pigs, with Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. Uh, uh, and then, you know, then you, then you, uh, 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 you know, you throw in some other countries in there in the European Union that had some I issues uh, as well, like Italy. And when that happened, of course, we saw a major drop in the euro versus the U.S. dollar and the euro versus many other currency pairs. Why? Because many of those major economies in the European Union, they had a, an inverse uh, a debt to income level. Okay, so. Anytime you're looking at gross domestic product, you have to look at short-term debt and long-term debt also, all right? It's very simple to do. These numbers come out on a regular basis. Uh, uh, at the end of this, I'm going to get access to a, a report that you can download that will actually show you where to go specifically on a month-by-month -month basis to look at these particular different uh, economic indicators and keep track of them. The number two thing is consumer price index, and this is the index used to measure inflation. Now, the question to ask is this, is the trend of inflation rising or is it falling in the major economies of the world? Consumer price index is the only way, in my opinion, to really measure inflation. And if you've looked at a consumer price index, for instance, in the U.S., it's been on a steady incline uh, since, you know, 2010. It's been on a steady incline. So, uh, while the Fed comes out with the inflation rate, and they say that the inflation rate is about 1.7, 1.9% right now, I believe, the consumer price index, the cost of goods to consumers has been going up. Everyday items like milk, like gasoline, uh, like utilities, uh, those things have been uh, climbing, energy prices. Those things have been climbing, and they've been getting more expensive for the consumer. So when you have things getting more expensive for the consumer, what happens? Spending slows down. That means that your gross domestic product, your GDP, what a country puts out is going to slow down. Anytime that happens, obviously, you're going to see a, a rise uh, or, or a falling in interest rates. When an economy grows too fast, you're going to see a rise in interest rates. That's the way generally that we use to combat these economies that either shrink too quickly or grow too quickly. When interest rates rise, what happens? Well, generally money will flow out of a lesser paying interest or a lesser paying investment into a higher paying investment. So money goes into currencies if interest rates are rising. For instance, back in the day, back in the heyday in like 2000, between 2004 and 2007, there was a thing called the carry trade. Uh, and the carry trade happened because uh, there were economies, countries that had high, high interest rates, and there were countries that had very low interest rates. 
Well, obviously the money is going to flow into the higher interest rate and out of the lower interest rate. Also, at the time, we had global risk. So when global risk happens, money goes out of the equities markets and into the safer investments like fixed assets, currencies, bonds, uh, treasuries, things like that. And so when you can pit one low interest rate economy against a high interest rate economy, then obviously you have a winner situation there. That's when you can capitalize on a big trend. Since most economies have low interest rates now to combat uh, a slowing down of their, of their, of their economies, uh, we generally don't have that kind of a scenario right now where interest rates are not as important. But there will come a day where interest rates are going to have to rise again and where they're going to come back into uh, the view and the big picture of you know, uh, of a, a real strong fundamental, uh, fundamental shift. All right, the next thing that we look at is quantitative easing. That's money printing. Quantitative easing is extremely important. It's probably of our particular time right now that we're in, this is probably the most important economic indicator uh, is quantitative easing. How much money printing is going on? What are the central banks of an economy saying about what they're going to do to either fight uh, inflation or to uh, 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 jumpstart a stagnated economy. Once we get a picture of this or anytime there's any kind of a shift in saying we're going to print more money or we're going to print less money, there's generally going to be a big move happen in the markets. All right. Next up is risk on risk off. This is basically a terminology that's used a lot on the street for uh, where, where the risk is. If the risk is on, right, then that means that guess what? We're willing to take risks. We're going to buy stocks. We're going to put money into the equities markets and we're going to uh, drive equity prices higher. If risk is off, that means that guess what? The, the, the environment's too risky right now. We're going to take our money out of the equities markets. Well, when money comes out of the equities markets, it goes into other markets like treasuries, like bonds, like fixed income, it goes into uh, investments that are safer, the U.S. dollar being one of them. That's when you have a big increase generally in the U.S. dollar uh, versus other, other currencies. The next thing that I look at is the CRB Commodity Index. Basically, this is an index that measures the price of commodities across the board. So when the dollar is losing value, commodity prices generally rise. So one way to hedge against a falling dollar if you're in the U.S., is to invest in currencies that are tied to commodity prices, such as the Canadian dollar uh, and the Australian dollar. So if commodities are on the rise, those are the best currencies uh, to, 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 to be invested in. Some of the, the best currencies anyways, not necessarily the best, but some of the best to be invested in, right? And that's why we've seen uh, over the years when commodity prices were really on the rise, that's why we saw such a rise in the Canadian dollar versus the US dollar. That's why we sell such a rise in the Australian dollar versus the U.S. dollar. Why? Because those particular countries are tied and those currencies are tied to commodity pricing. Now, here is an example of GDP uh, going from a positive number to a negative number very rapidly. This happened in the first quarter of 2008, right? Here we see this is the 2008 uh, crisis. This is the, the meltdown here that took place and to gain significant value uh, against the euro, the great British pound, and many other currencies, right? So here we have the U.S. dollar went from a positive number the previous quarter to a negative number, to a negative growth rate of negative 2.7. This happened the first quarter, right here around uh, April is when that was released, right? And so we see that Right here in this particular area between April and June, we went into a sideways market, and then we had a perfect reversal type of a scenario here, and this actually predicted this big long move down when you pit these two things together, technicals plus the fundamentals here, uh, you have a winning scenario here where you could have capitalized on a very, very big trend to the downside. Then here, in 2009, where you saw it begin to rise in 2009 here is when it came back up to a positive number, right? You see that the trend started to shift a little bit. We started to gain back some losses here. 
uh, the, the U.S. dollar wasn't necessarily the safe haven anymore. Investors started to put money back into the stock markets, into the equities markets, all right? Now, let's talk about three types of technical trades that I make in particular. They are breakouts, reversals, and continuation trades. I'm going to show you uh, three different types of trades that you can make on the charts uh, whether or not you have a big trend that you can predict or not, it doesn't really matter, all right? Now, let's look at how this combined approach can examples. But let's look at this one. Here was an article that came out uh, in CNN Money, and this article came out in September, on September 19, 2012. And here was the headline of the article. Bank of Japan announces new monetary easing. All right, the Bank of Japan announced Wednesday that it would expand its asset purchase program by 10 trillion, uh, tr 10 trillion yen in an effort to stimulate its economy as global demand slows. Now, this announcement comes less than a week after the U.S. Federal Reserve announced its last stimulus plan. Right, so what's happening? Well, all of these particular economies are trying to stimulate their economy. They're trying to grow their economy. So what do they have to do? They have to drive the price of their currency down. If you want to stimulate an economy, you have to make a currency cheap. You have to make it cheap for businesses to actually produce goods. You have to make it cheap for businesses to operate. You have to make it cheap for other economies to purchase your goods versus going to uh, your competitor. Okay. So what they do is they drive the price of their currency down. That's exactly what the Bank of Japan did by announcing, listen, we're going to do whatever it takes to stimulate this economy. We're going to pump money into the economy. We're going to make lending super cheap, and we're going to give money uh, that's very easy to get. So what happens? Money flows out of right the Japanese yen into other currencies. Right, The value of the Japanese yen goes down, and we see – that from this announcement, from September, here's the, here's the announcement, September 19th, right around this area, we can see that that's when this trend really started, all right? And this was really a 1,200 pip move that could have been capitalized on when you mix this kind of an announcement with some, uh, some, technical, uh, some technical analysis and some ways to get in and out of them, all right? This is really a combined approach. This is how capitalizing on a very big trend and being able to capture, you know, in this one particular move, you could capture, you know, 50% return if you played the cards right. And depending on what your risk tolerance was and so on and so forth. And that's risking a very small amount, by the way. If you risk 2% on a trade or on a multiple trades, you could easily capture 50% return on just one move. So uh, 10,000 turns into 5,000, 100,000 turns into 150,000. All right, it's it's being able to identify and see these particular types of, of 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 announcements that come out and these shifts in these major economic indicators that really gives you the big picture view so that you can start seeing how to capitalize on big uh, trends. Uh, so what if there is no major change or no real big news to look for? Uh, you know, big trades, right? Well. Let's go to the charts and I'll show you two very simple approaches and things that you can use right now, no matter what market you're trading, no matter what, whether you're trading currencies or stocks or commodities or bonds, it really doesn't matter, all right? Whether you're trading the S&P 500 or, or whatever, okay? It really doesn't matter. So here I have a chart. It's the pound dollar chart. It's a very simple chart that I've set up. It has a few indicators on here. One of them is, two of them are proprietary indicators, but you don't need these indicators to, uh, to you know, to really use these particular approaches. This one here, uh, let me just get my, all right, tool up here so that I can show you on the screen. This indicator here, all right, with these, single and double arrows, and then there are some triple arrows too if we were to look at it. This indicator is what I call a market structure indicator. Basically, the market, when you look at a technical chart, the market is like a language, okay? The price action is like a language, all right? If, if price action is like a language, 
then market structure is really the the learning how to read the ABCs of the language. All right, market structure has three different structures. You have short term market structure, you have intermediate term market structure, and you have long term market structure. For the purpose of this particular Second, let me uh, let me get let me get that uh, fixed. All right, we should be good to go now. Sorry about that, guys. So uh, <clears throat> basically, this indicator here. Uh, that uh, is a single green uh, arrow, uh, also a single red arrow, short-term market structure, okay? The double ones, I intermediate term structure, and the triple ones, which I don't have up on this chart, but I'll pull it back here in just a second, and you'll be able to see it, identify long-term market structure. For the purpose of this particular demonstration, we are concerned with any time the, the market structure changes, <clears throat> in one direction to intermediate market structure, all right? Now, anytime we have a, a low, for instance, here we had a lower low than the previous and a, and a lower low than the following, all right? And then we had a higher high on either side. That's a short-term market structure low. Now, there are some caveats here. The caveat is that we can't have an inside or an outside bar, okay? An inside or an outside bar, for instance, would be this one right here. This would be uh, what we would consider uh, an outside bar, right? So this bar right here went outside, okay, above the high here. That that's an that's an outside bar. We can't consider that. Anytime we have an inside bar, so let's find an example here of an inside bar that we can use to identify this. So here is an example of an inside bar, okay? So this bar is on the inside. Of this move right here all right so we can't consider that so it has to be an outside bar it, it has to be it has to it can't be an inside bar it can't be an outside bar all right so here we have short-term market structure right we have the the lower low here here we have a higher high right but a lower low here and a lower low here finally it breaks out of the low right here that becomes short-term market structure so anytime you have short-term market structure on either side of another lower short-term market structure, you have an intermediate term market structure low that forms. So when this short-term market structure low formed, when this high got broken, this was already a short-term market structure low right here. This immediately became an intermediate structure low. Anytime you have a shift in market structure, you can now begin to look for trades in the direction of that market structure shift. So for instance, this became an intermediate term market structure low. Tried to prices tried to run back down to that. By the, by the way, this is a daily chart. Prices tried to run back down to that level, couldn't quite get there, found support right here in this area, and prices reversed. We had a break above this high right here. This became short-term market structure low right here, which turned this into intermediate term structure low. The next day, we're looking to buy the market, all right? And what happens? Well, the last two days have been up days. Today has been uh, basically, a, 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 it's, it's been a, a, you know, a, a day where there, there was up move, there was down move, both, uh, but we're basically closing at the, pretty much the open price, all right? So anytime you have this happen, you can start looking for buying that particular market. Anytime market structure shifts, uh, for instance here, let me just erase this and then we'll So here you had market structure shift. You had this short-term uh, structure high right here form, which actually turned this into an intermediate structure high first because we had a short-term structure high over here. 
Well, the moment that happens, we can start looking for sell signals. Now, uh, here we did have a, a slow, but it didn't quite happen. Then we had an intermediate structure or another short term structure form here in the direction of this intermediate term structure. And that's where things really took off. This actually happened in conjunction with a reversal pattern as well. And that's when we had a big down move to the downside, right? Now, we generally want to see these structure levels change near or close to the previous structure level. For instance, here we had a short term structure low. Here we had a short term structure low. But it wasn't until this point that we had another short term structure low. And look how far away that is, right? So we're not really looking at it from that particular viewpoint. We want to see a very close structure shift like we saw right here, like we saw right here, where we had a big move to the downside. Now, anytime that happens, all we have to do is shift down a time frame or two time frames, or even if you're day trading, you can go down to a lower time frame like the 15 minute or the five minute chart, and you can look for buying opportunities. So for instance, market structure shifted at the close of April 7th here. All right. So if we go down to the four hour chart and we look at April 7th, all right, well, we obviously have a breakout point that happens in eight, on, on April 8th. Here's a breakout level right here. It broke out right here. So we have an opportunity to buy. If we go down a time frame even further to say the one hour chart, we see that we have even more opportunity, right? So here's April 7th. Here's the close of April 7th immediately. April 8th, we're looking for buy signals. What happens? Well, we get a break out of this level right here, and you can see that prices took off. Then we have what we call a pullback. This leads to a continuation pattern. Now, you can use something like the RSI, the stochastic. You can even use the Williams percentage range uh, to identify these pullbacks that are in line with the trend. When the market's trending like this, you have a pullback and prices dip back below uh, an oversold level like right here you have a buying opportunity when they come back above that oversold level, which happened right here. That gave a perfect buying opportunity. And as you can see, there was another push up in the market. So anytime there's a market structure shift, right, that gives us an opportunity to buy the market or sell the market. Now we want to look at a higher time frame and shift down first. All right. So for instance, we could go up to uh, the, the, the daily, we could go up to the weekly if, if we were so inclined. And anytime we see a market shift, we know that we're looking at some major buying opportunity. Here's a weekly chart. Let me show you how this works on the weekly chart. Here was a, here's, here's how you can, you can get a very strong picture of how an entire week in the market is going to go. All right. Here was an opportunity that we had on this particular chart. And there were a couple of opportunities where this happened. Here was a, uh, a, a short term market structure low that formed. This also became a short term market structure low when this high got broken. Well, that whole week, look what happened. The market rallied up second week. OK, here is here is an example where it didn't quite pan out in our favor, where we had market structure shift right here. All right. This week ended up a down week, but the following week, you know, it, it turned back around and it started going back to the upside. Well, the good news is that as soon as that high got, this became a short term market structure low, which turned this into an intermediate structure low. And you can see what happened from there. The next three weeks, prices in this particular currency in the pound dollar took off to the upside. All right. Here's an example of a one week shift in market structure where we had market structure change here to a short term. Then we had another short term structure as soon as this low got broken. That gave us a whole week here, just about where prices dropped down. We could have made a lot of money during that particular week. So anytime you have these particular things happen in the market, you have to be patient and wait for them. But when they happen, generally the probabilities are very high that the market is going to rally in that particular direction during that week, that month, that day. Doesn't really matter what time frame you go to. Generally, over that period of time, whether it's a week, a month, a day, an hour, four hour period, or several four hour periods, or several hourly periods, the market is generally going to rally around. So, that's one way that you can start to capitalize on trends. Now, you can do this no matter what your system type is. If you're a day trader, you simply wait for these market structure shifts 
And then that day, the next day that the market structure shift happens, you start looking for buying opportunities or selling opportunities, whichever direction the market structure shift happens. Now, let me go and show you another technique. I call this technique a power move first reversal. All right, a power move first reversal. And this particular technique uh, was taught to me by uh, a trading veteran uh, that really uh, has used this in multiple trading championships. And it works over and over and over and over again, no matter what time frame you're looking at. All right. So how does a power move first reversal happen? Well, it's very simple. Anytime you have a big move that's outside of the ordinary. So for instance, right here in this candle, we had a one big candle that engulfed these two candles right here. As a matter of fact, we're only looking at, for instance, if we have one candle, we're only looking at the previous candle. So this was a big power move to the downside right here. This is a daily chart. The very next day, we had what I call a reversal. All right, we had a reversal. That means that price action reversed against this particular power move and it closed higher than the previous day's close. All right, when that happens and we have a big power move and then we have a reversal, the next day we want to start looking to sell the market. All right. And you can sell the market over several periods. In this case, it happened that the market was down one, two, three, four, five days, really six days before you finally had a reversal in this particular market. All right. Here's another example where you have a big power move in this candle. This engulfed the last three candles. It was as big of a move as the last previous three candles. Okay. The next day, what happened? You had a lower close than the open. This was the beginning of the week and we had a gap down and it closed lower than the high here, lower than the close here, all right? The next day, we start looking for moves to the upside. So you have a power move here, you have a power move, you have another power move here, another power move here, another power move here. Now, really, you want to minimize this to only three particular days, all right? So any more than three days or three periods where you're looking at a power move, you don't want more than that. So for instance, here was one where you had one, two, three days. These three days engulfed the previous three days. One, two, three days here. We had a reversal day. All right, we start looking for sell signals. They don't come immediately, but if we hang in there, we eventually get them. All right, now in this particular case, if I was just using the daily chart, I would buy at the open of this day, or I would sell at the open of this day, and I would put my stop back up here above this high, all right? The first big power move down day, I put my stop above this high. So in this case, I would buy here, I would put my stop down here, and then I would ride it until I got an exit signal, some kind of a reversal, all right? So that's how a power move first reversal works. Now, this will work on a weekly chart or to work on a, a daily chart or to work on a, an hourly chart. doesn't really matter. The key is what I like to do is find a higher time frame to find this on. Then I begin to shift down a time frame, just like we did with market structure. When market structure shifted here on this day, we shift down. And if the next day, we can start looking for buy signals. We can day trade this and catch a very big day here. All right. Now, that'll happen. Uh, that happens quite often. All right. Right. So, um, okay. Sorry about that. Management time. Uh, let me just uh, let me show you here. Uh, Yana will put up our link. You can go here. You can register for a webinar where I'll dive into this quite a bit more. Uh, I'll also give you this free report here, the five economic indicators for dominating the Forex market. Uh, so you can uh, feel free to go here to this particular page that I believe they'll put up email address. You can reserve your spot for the webinar, which will be on April 14th. And I'll spend more time diving into these particular techniques. And you'll also get this full blown report here, uh, which is about 20 pages, uh, which will actually uh, show you where to go to monitor these particular economic indicators and so on and so forth. So once again, thanks to uh, uh, Trading Pub for allowing me to present. Sorry for cutting into uh, the next guy's time. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Sorry I didn't get to answer any of your questions, but maybe I'll get to come on again uh, and have a little bit more time to uh, 
uh, to uh, show you these particular techniques.